Chapter Eleven of Napoleon the First: An Intimate Biography by Walter Gear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleven, eighteen hundred four, the Empire. After the execution of the Duc d'Enghien, the First Consul expressed to Joseph his intention of founding a Napoleonic dynasty. I always intended, he said, to end the revolution by the establishment of heredity but i thought such a step could not be taken before the lapse of five or six years but events had moved faster than he expected the jacobins had looked upon the pomp and parade of the consulate court as a prelude to the return of the bourbons with the first consul in the role of monk they therefore hailed with joy the execution of enguin henceforth it would be war to the knife between bonaparte and the bourbons a few days after the execution fouché appealed to the senate to establish hereditary power in the person of napoleon as the surest means of preserving the benefits of the revolution he argued that this would put an end to the royalist plots for even if they struck down the man they could not end the system so as events turned out the royalists thwarted their own purposes and ensured the establishment of the empire appeals more or less spontaneous now began to pour in from all parts of france for the adoption of the principle of hereditary rule there is no doubt as to the fact that napoleon both as a warrior and as a statesman had established a valid claim to the nation's gratitude after hearing fouché's adroit speech the senate voted almost unanimously in favour of hereditary rule in the tribunate only one member carnot voted against the proposition on the eighteenth of may eighteen hundred four a senatus consultum formally decreed to napoleon bonaparte the title of emperor of the french a committee of the senate waited upon napoleon at the chateau of st cloud to notify him and the following day he came to the tuileries where he held a large reception napoleon who at the beginning of his career had expressed such strong republican sentiments was at the bottom of his nature essentially monarchical one of his deepest regrets says metternich was that he could not invoke the principle of legitimacy as the basis of his power few men have felt more profoundly than he how much without this foundation authority is precarious and fragile and how exposed it is to attack napoleon expressed the same sentiment on one occasion when he said that he was the only sovereign in europe who could not return to his capital after a defeat with the same assurance of welcome as if he had gained a victory the dignitaries of state under the empire were the constable of france louis bonaparte the grand elector joseph bonaparte the high admiral of france joachim murat the arch chancellor of the empire cambacerès the arch chancellor of state eugene beauharnais and the arch treasurer of the empire lebrun with the emperor these six grand dignitaries formed the grand council of the empire the titles had been borrowed in part from the holy roman empire and in part from the old monarchy of france two of the dignitaries were napoleon's brothers who stood next to him in line of succession two were his relations by marriage and two were his former colleagues in the consulate the other two brothers of napoleon were absent and out of favour lucien for having married madame joubertou after the death of his first wife and jerome because of his marriage with miss patterson of baltimore the new constitution of the year twelve of the republic was now submitted to popular vote the plebiscite was worded as follows the french people decree the heredity of the imperial dignity in the descendants direct natural legitimate and adopted of napoleon bonaparte and in the descendants direct natural and legitimate of joseph bonaparte and louis bonaparte all of the brothers were offended by these stipulations lucien and jerome because they were excluded from the line of succession joseph and louis because their children were mentioned instead of themselves more than three and a half million votes were cast for the new constitution a number which exceeded those given for the consulate and the consulate for life only twenty-five hundred votes were recorded in the negative besides the grand dignitaries of the empire mentioned above there were six grand officers of the crown napoleon's uncle cardinal fesch was grand ammoner talleyrand grand chamberlain and later vice-grand elector berthier chief ranger and later vice-constable coulaincourt master of horse duroc marshal of the palace and segur master of ceremonies there were also four colonel-generals davout 
commander of the grenadier a pied sous commander of the chasseur a pied bessieres commander of the cavalry and mortier commander of the artillery and the sailors these officers of the imperial guard formed a part of the household of the emperor and enjoyed the same prerogatives as the grand officers of the crown the emperor's mother was to be styled madame mere and his sisters became imperial highnesses with their several establishments of ladies-in-waiting it now remained to satisfy the army by no means an easy task and napoleon revived for the benefit of his most distinguished generals the ancient and honourable title of marshal of france this dignity originated in the thirteenth century there was at first only one marechal de france and there were but two until the time of francis i their number afterwards became unlimited the list of the new marshals was published in the moniteur of the nineteenth of may eighteen hundred four it comprised fourteen names on the active list and four honorary appointments with seats in the senate the original fourteen were berthier murat moncé jourdan masséna augereau bernadotte soult brune lannes mortier ney davoux and bessieres while on the inactive list lefebvre pirignon and serrurier all of whom except lefebvre were over fifty years of age an examination of the list reveals in most cases the reasons for the selection Masséna was the greatest soldier of france and the only one with perhaps the exception of davoux and soult who was capable of independent command berthier as chief of staff and murat and lannes as division and corps commanders in italy and egypt had one distinction ney and mortier were considered as coming men bessieres was commander of the cavalry of the new imperial guard the appointments of augereau and bernadotte were made mainly for political reasons the names of the others were connected with glorious victories of the republic at the time of the first creation moreau the victor of hohenlinden was in disgrace and hoche clébert de saint and leclerc were dead but there were other officers of distinction like macdonald victor st cyr and marmont who thought they should have been included and were much disappointed before the end of the empire eight more batons were granted in eighteen hundred seven victor was made honorary marshal not on the active list macdonald oudinot and marmont were appointed in eighteen hundred nine for their exceptional services during the campaign of Wagram it was said at the time that napoleon having lost lannes needed three marshals to fill his place but it is only fair to state that although none of the new men was to be compared with lannes they were all quite as good generals as some of the marshals on the original list in eighteen eleven suchet received the baton for his services at the battle and siege of valencia and st cyr was appointed during the russian campaign of eighteen twelve prince poniatowski was honoured only two days before his death at leipzig in eighteen thirteen the last marshal to be appointed was grouchy just prior to the waterloo campaign of eighteen fifteen in which he proved himself so grossly incompetent of the twenty-six marshals nine had held commissions ranging from lieutenant to general in the old royal army eleven had begun as privates in the ranks and of these nine had risen to the rank of sergeant but it must be remembered that the standing of the non-commissioned officers in the old service was very high as the officers left to them the entire organization discipline and control of the troops it is rather a remarkable fact that only three of the marshals lost their lives on the field of battle lannes received his death wounds at essling in eighteen hundred nine bessieres was killed at lutzen in eighteen thirteen and poniatowski was drowned in the elzer after the battle of leipzig the same year five met violent deaths after the fall of the empire murat and ney were shot berthy died from an accident and brune was murdered in eighteen fifteen and mortier was killed by an infernal machine at paris in eighteen thirty five all the other marshals outlived the empire most of them by many years the last two survivors soult and marmont living until after the middle of the century when napoleon became emperor he was thirty-five years of age he was in the prime of life in the full possession of all his magnificent intellectual powers he was gifted with a wonderful brain perhaps the most marvellous ever given to man lucid precise tireless swift in its processes tenacious in its grip 
served by an accurate and capacious memory all of his intellectual resources were available at any moment he said of himself different matters are stored away in my brain as in a chest of drawers when i wish to interrupt a piece of work i close that drawer and open another none of them ever get mixed never does this inconvenience or fatigue me when i am ready i shut all the drawers and go to sleep in him there existed a rare combination of the poetic and the practical the dreamer and the man of action joined to an almost superhuman activity at st helena he said work is my element for which i was born and fitted i have known the limits of my arms and legs i have never discovered those of my power of work he never spent more than twenty minutes at his meals and needed only four hours of sleep a day he was able to fall asleep at will and awaken with his mind instantly alert working sixteen to twenty hours a day he drove his secretaries at full speed his published correspondence fills thirty-two volumes although not more than a third of his letters have yet been printed his proclamations and his bulletins were masterpieces his conversation was brilliant and animated every one listened to him with pleasure although he was frequently rude and ill-bred in his manners when he wished to gain his point no one could be more fascinating all writers have spoken of the charm of his smile no more attractive picture of napoleon has ever been sketched than that of the royalist marquise de la tour du pin in her charming recollections of the revolution and the empire says hazen he made his ministers mere hard-worked servants but he won the admiration and devotion of his soldiers by the glamour of his victories and he held the peasantry in the hollow of his hand by constantly guaranteeing them their lands and their civil equality in their opinion the only things in the revolution that counted he was as little as he was big he is a man of whom more evil and more good can be said and has been said than of many historical figures he cannot easily be described and certainly not in any brief compass he ranks with alexander caesar charlemagne as one of the most powerful conquerors and rulers of history it is by no means certain that napoleon would not be considered the greatest of them all in the award of honours many outspoken republicans like st cyr and macdonald were excluded bernadotte though not in favour was treated with consideration because he had married the sister of joseph's wife he was presented by napoleon with the house in paris which had formerly belonged to moreau while the latter's estate of grosbois near paris went to the faithful berthier but the grand army was entrusted to the command of men upon whom napoleon could absolutely rely like davout soult and ney the record of the great generals of the republic is in the main a gloomy one Usch had died in the rhineland de say was killed at marengo and Clibert was assassinated the same day at cairo leclerc was a victim of the unhealthy climate of st domingue pichegru was strangled in prison and moreau was put on trial for high treason the evidence against moreau was not conclusive the utmost that could be proved was that he desired napoleon's overthrow that he had three interviews with pichegru and that he did not reveal the plot to the government he was condemned to two years in prison but was accorded the permission to retire to the united states in order to furnish him with funds for his exile the emperor purchased his house in the rue d'anjou st honore for the sum of eight hundred thousand francs much more than its real value and presented it to bernadotte through the supplications of josephine and madame murat the death sentences of the duc de polignac and the marquis de riviere were commuted to four years of imprisonment followed by deportation and these two acts of clemency did much to diminish the irritation of the royalists napoleon was now absolute master of france although the new coins of the empire bore the inscription république française napoleon empereur only the shadow of the republic remained no one longer thought of it the republican fete of the fourteenth of july was celebrated by a solemn distribution of the crosses of the legion d'honneur it was the first public appearance of the new sovereigns for the first time they traversed in a carriage the grand allee of the gardens of the tuileries accompanied by a magnificent escort they went in great state to the église des invalides which during the republic had been a temple of mars and which the empire had again made a catholic church during the ceremony the emperor called to him cardinal caprara who had negotiated the concordat 
and who was soon to be very instrumental in persuading the pope to come to paris for the coronation detaching from his neck the grand cordon of the legion d'honneur napoleon presented it to this venerable prelate in spite of the enthusiasm of the people and of the army it was already evident to serious observers that the new regime without the solid foundation which resists misfortunes had need of perpetual success in order to endure napoleon was condemned not only to succeed but to dazzle and to subjugate the world his empire demanded extraordinary pomp gigantic adventures colossal victories like his nephew napoleon the third he comprehended the difficulties of his role and realized how necessary it is to give a nation glory in order to make it forget its liberty this perpetual need of action and of renown was to be at once the cause of the strength and of the weakness of napoleon's career before being crowned by the pope in imitation of charlemagne napoleon wished to visit the tomb of the great emperor of whom he considered himself the worthy successor in his visit to aix-la-chapelle he was preceded by several days by the empress who wished to take the waters of that city three days after the july fete the emperor had left the camp at boulogne after remaining there several weeks and visiting other points along the coast napoleon rejoined josephine at aix-la-chapelle on the third of september when the great emperor's tomb was opened his skeleton was found clothed in roman garb the double crown of france and germany encircled the skull beside him lay his famous sword and around his neck was hung the celebrated talisman which brought him success this talisman was a piece of the real cross encased in an emerald which was hung to a thick gold ring by a slender chain this relic was presented to napoleon by the city authorities and he wore it on his breast at austerlitz and wagram in eighteen thirteen he gave it to hortense the talisman was in the bedroom of napoleon the third when he died at chiselhurst and in nineteen twenty just before her death was presented by the empress eugenie to the trésor of the celebrated cathedral at reims which was so much damaged by the german bombardment during the great war from aix la chapelle the sovereigns proceeded via cologne to mayence here the emperor found himself surrounded by a regular court of german princes the journey along the banks of the rhine made a great impression on france and on the rest of europe napoleon desired to have his imperial title consecrated by a grand religious ceremony which would have an immense effect on the whole catholic world the date of the coronation was finally fixed for the second of december eighteen hundred four just a month before the pope pius the seventh then sixty-two years of age set out for paris three weeks later he was met by napoleon at fontainebleau where he remained several days and then proceeded to paris and took up his quarters in the tuileries in the pavillon de flore all paris was agitated by the approach of the great event the hotels were full to overflowing there were rehearsals of the coronation as for a great theatrical production all the details had been arranged by the emperor in advance with as much care as the plan of a great battle at last the second of december dawned from early morning all paris was on foot the sky was overcast and it was very cold but no one thought of the rigour of the season the pope left the tuileries for notre dame at nine o'clock and napoleon and josephine followed an hour later in a carriage with joseph and louis arrived at the palace of the archbishop napoleon put on the coronation costume over a narrow robe of white satin he wore a heavy mantle of crimson velvet on his head he placed a crown of golden laurels on his neck the collar of the legion d'honneur in diamonds at his side a sword ornamented with the regent diamond after the high mass the pope blessed the imperial ornaments and then returned them to the emperor the ring which he passed upon his finger the sword which he replaced in its sheath the mantle which was attached to his shoulders by the chamberlains then the sceptre and the hand of justice which he gave to the arch-treasurer and the arch-chancellor the only ornament which remained to be handed to the emperor was the crown as the pope was about to proceed with this last act of the ceremony napoleon took from his hands the sign of supreme power and proudly placed it himself upon his head he then approached the empress who was kneeling before him and tenderly placed the imperial diadem upon her head 
this scene is familiar to all who have seen in the louvre the celebrated painting of the coronation by david which however is not entirely accurate as madame mere who was not present is depicted the ceremony was a great success and napoleon said to joseph if our father could see us now it was after six o'clock when the imperial party returned to the tuileries and napoleon fatigued after so much pomp resumed with pleasure his modest uniform of colonel of the chasseurs de la garde he dined alone with josephine whom he begged to retain the diadem which she wore so gracefully and which became her so well the coronation was the signal for a series of fêtes of which perhaps the most brilliant was that given to the emperor and empress by the marshals of the empire at the opera which was then located in the rue richelieu this building was torn down under the restoration after the death of the duc de berry who was assassinated on the very threshold of the theatre it was succeeded by the building in the rue le pelletier constructed on the site of the former gardens of the hotel de choiseul which was the scene of the celebrated attempt of orsini on the life of napoleon the third in eighteen fifty eight two years later the present superb national academy of music was begun in the place de l'opera but was not finished until four years after the downfall of the second empire the visit of the pope to paris was marked by two other religious ceremonies josephine had informed him at fontainebleau that her union with napoleon had never been blessed by the church he at once announced to napoleon that a religious ceremony must be performed before the coronation so napoleon and josephine were privately married in the chapel of the tuileries by cardinal fesch on the evening before the coronation a week before the departure of the pope for rome the second son of louis and hortense napoleon louis was baptized with great pomp by the pope himself at st cloud on the twenty fourth of march eighteen hundred five the gallery of the chateau was converted into a chapel for the ceremony on this occasion madame mere was present on the fourth of april eighteen hundred five the pope left paris and about the same time the emperor and empress set out from fontainebleau for milan where napoleon was to be crowned as king of italy at turin on the twenty ninth of april they made their adieus to pius the seventh who proceeded to rome on the third of may napoleon met at alessandria his youngest brother jerome who had incurred his displeasure by the marriage with miss patterson two years before before leaving paris the emperor had finally persuaded his mother to sign a formal protest against this marriage on the ground that under the law of the year one of the republic any marriage was null and void if contracted by a minor without the consent of his father and mother a few days later jerome arrived at lisbon with his wife he was allowed to land but she was forced to re-embark for england under orders from the emperor jerome travelled post-haste to italy after a decisive interview with napoleon jerome basely agreed to abandon his wife and her unborn child and was again restored to favour napoleon's coronation as king of italy took place the twenty sixth of may eighteen hundred five in the beautiful cathedral of milan the weather was magnificent and the city was crowded with people josephine although she bore the title of queen of italy was not to be crowned after the religious ceremonies which were similar to those at notre dame napoleon himself placed upon his head the celebrated iron crown of the ancient kings of lombardy at the same time using the traditional formula god gave it me woe to him who touches it he then took the crown of italy which he placed on his head in the same manner on the seventh of june napoleon appointed prince eugene de beauharnais as viceroy of the kingdom of italy and three days later with josephine he left milan on a visit to the celebrated battlefields the first week in july was passed at genoa where magnificent fete were given to celebrate the incorporation of the ancient republic in the french empire from genoa they proceeded to turin where the emperor received news of the organization of the third coalition napoleon accompanied by josephine left immediately for france travelling incognito at full speed without any escort he arrived at fontainebleau on the eleventh of july after an absence of exactly one hundred days the speed at which napoleon travelled may be of interest four days after his arrival he wrote to jeanne as follows i arrived at fontainebleau eighty-five hours after my departure from turin nevertheless i lost three hours on mont and i stopped constantly on account of the empress 
one or two hours to breakfast and one or two hours to dine made me lose eight or ten hours more the distance by rail is about four hundred forty miles and the express trains via the mont -Senis tunnel make the run to-day in about fourteen hours allowing for the delays of which he speaks and the longer distance by road napoleon travelled at the rate of nearly seven miles an hour napoleon at once began to work on the plans for the campaign which was to open the following month and which was to end on the anniversary of his coronation in the glorious victory of austerlitz End of chapter eleven